Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this Hints of Performance Masterclass on Performing Under Pressure. My name is Nora. I'm the COO of Hintsa, and I will be your host today. This last weekend, the first Formula One race of the season kicked off in Bahrain. Formula One is arguably one of the most demanding sports in the world, both physically and cognitively. It has a long season and a very grueling travel schedule. Our team at Hintsa have worked in Formula One for almost 30 years now, and we always get the same questions. How do the drivers and the teams perform under pressure? How do they maintain focus and energy? And what does well-being have to do with it? And what can I do to copy what they do? Here to answer all of these questions and any questions that you may have during the session are our panelists, Chris Gooder and Dan Sims. May I ask you guys to share a few sentences by way of introduction? Chris. Thanks, Nora, and hello, everybody. Um, lovely to, to be with you today. Uh, my name's Chris. I am the Performance Psychology Specialist um, at HIMSA. Um, in really simple terms, uh, performance psychology looks at the mind and behaviour and how that impacts upon performance more often than not under pressure. Um, my background is in elite level sports, uh, mainly um, from professional football to rugby, tennis, golf. Um, I always say name a sport and I've probably had a shot at it at, at one stage or another with varying degrees of success, but it's Formula One that's kept me busy um, the most, um, just back from Bahrain for the first race of the year, um, which marks my eighth season um, of working with hints of drivers, uh, coaches and teams. Dan. Thanks, Nora. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, good to be here as well. So I'm a senior performance coach. Um, and I guess someone called me recently the, the Swiss army knife of, uh, of uh, sport and performance. But yeah, we get involved in everything. My background's uh, as a strength and conditioning coach. Um, so uh, I joined Hintzer in 2016 uh, to help prepare uh, Raymond Grosjean for his uh, Formula One um, start and um, yeah, career in, in the Haas team. I worked with um, yeah, a couple of uh, Formula One drivers since then, and we have to yeah take care of the physical side, but also other uh, lifestyle holistic elements, yeah, sleep, nutrition, um, even you know obviously liaising with Chris on the on the psychology side as well. Excellent, glad to have you here with me today. Now this should not be a one way show. We use Mentimeter for interaction. So head over to menti.com and enter this code or alternatively scan the QR code that you see now on the screen. You can also submit questions. You see those probably at the bottom of your screen if you're on desktop. Um, anything you would like to ask the panelists, what are you interested in? And how do the strategies that you hear perhaps apply to the demands in your work? And what would you like to hear more about there? While you get set up on Mentimeter, I'll give you a minute to do so. Let's hear from Dan and Chris. What are your ref reflections on the upcoming Formula One season at this point? I'll go first. Um, so I'm I'm just back from Bahrain. I landed um, on on Sunday, um, and actually, like every other Formula One season um, that I've been involved in, at least. Pre-season was a mix of um, trying to manage expectations. We'll talk about that later in the um, in the presentation today. But really, the, the the greatest challenge from a psychological perspective is that F1 is so unique in as much as you don't know until those first push laps on uh, a quali session, qualification session, ordinarily on a Saturday evening, this time around on a Friday evening, how the machinery that you're working with uh, for the rest of the year is going to be. They go pre-season testing, they have their practice sessions in the build-up to the race weekend, but you have no idea. And that uncertainty creates, from a psychological perspective, um, lots of unpleasant feelings that they're having having to deal with. M my job is to help the, the drivers manage that, put plans in place and do the prep work to allow them to manage that. And it, and it must be said, some drivers dealt with it better than others, but um, as always, it, it's shaping up to be um, a highly exciting season um, and a very competitive one if you take uh, Max Verstappen and Red Bull out of the equation. <laughs> Dan, how about you? 
Yeah, so I'm not directly involved with with one driver this time. Um, so I get to sit back and watch it from a bit more of a spectator's view. But I think the challenges are going to be huge in terms of it's it's the biggest calendar uh, that we've ever seen. So I think especially with some of the smaller teams, um, their resources are going to be are going to be tested, um, and the drivers and the coaches, um, you know, their powers of recovery, um, especially, um, and uh, yeah, ability to be resilient are going to be tested as well. So it'll be interesting to see how it you know how it shifts throughout the throughout the year because typically you don't necessarily see. Um, again take red ball out maybe um you know this the same order all the time um mm. you know the ability to develop and adapt is going to be is going to be important so in preparation for this session uh we've landed on four different themes but maybe we'll jump around a bit also depending on what the questions are that come in we'll start by talking about focus what does it mean in formula one and how do you achieve it then we'll talk about how to be fit to drive. How do the drivers prepare for optimal performance? Third, and invariably, things go wrong. So how do you make yourself fit to crash, at least psychologically? And fourth, it's a long season, like we already heard. How do you work in recovery so that you are fit to last? To get us going, we will launch the first poll for our audience. And the poll is, what are the top three cognitive demands placed on you in your work? And this is a list that we've actually taken from a future of work study, the skills required of knowledge workers. Now, Chris and Dan, from these, which seem to be getting quite even uh, amounts of points, which are relevant for Formula One drivers? Chris. I'm looking at that list and I'm thinking pretty much all of them, Nora. Um, yeah. Of course, the ability to focus, we're going to start on performing under pressure. Like I said, I've been involved in a number of sports. I, I would suggest in my experience, Formula One is, is the ultimate in terms of an exercise um, around performing under pressure. Really tiny margins, fairly catastrophic consequences um, if, if you get it wrong. Perhaps the, the one thing that we point to on that list that depending on the stage of the weekend that you're at, that perhaps might not be as important is the idea of creativity or innovative thinking. Now, innovation is often defined as um, failing failing fast. And perhaps when you're doing some testing, that's okay. If you're in a qualification session or a race, um, yeah, not the time to be trying trying new things um, uh, uh, to, to, to see how they play out, fail fast and, and learn off the back of. There's a time and a place for that, but um, perhaps not important sessions during the race weekend. So audience, please don't expect any input on innovation in this session. It will be more in execution mode and getting us geared up for that. But this does show how similar, in a way, what's needed for knowledge workers, business professionals, executives, etc., is to what actually happens in Formula One. Now, Dan, let's talk more about then focus, which is actually there as the top uh, skill that's needed. Put us into the head of a Formula One driver. What what does it look like? What are the demands? So yeah, I love to do this before talking about Formula One because we look at um, F1 drivers and we see the car, we see the helmet. Um, now with the halo, obvious uh, an important addition. Uh, we see less of the driver, um, and so we see less of the human being. Um, mm. And there's um, an incredible amount of cognitive, emotional skills that are required um, within um, driving a car at, at high speeds. Um, and if you can jump onto the next slide, Nora, just to give you a visual, you know, people that have seen Formula One, maybe even seen a, a steering wheel, will appreciate the demands of just operating the steering wheel. And the junior drivers find this incredibly challenging coming from, from F3 and F2. Um, and they've got to do this, obviously, in a high pressure environment, um, sometimes, you know, physically a high temperature environment. Um, they might be on the other side of the world. There's pressures from the team. There's pressures from social media, from media. There's all sorts of additional pressures. And you've got to operate this fairly complex uh, or very complex steering wheel. And if you do it well, it directly impacts your performance. So there's an incentive uh, to be able to uh, to operate this at a high level. You also need to 
um, you know, use your audio skills and, and speak and listen and absorb information that way. Um, so there's multiple sensors uh, going on um, and in quite a uh, very demanding environment. There's also dangers as well, if you could jump on Nora. And I worked with Roman Grosjean when he had this, this crash. Um, and, you know, it is a life and death sport. Um, and you can get very close to this. And again, you know, it's easy to forget this. It's easy to look forward to, to exciting races. And sometimes that involves some, some crashes. But actually, this is what the drivers in reality are facing. Um, and this suddenly puts you into a, a whole new psychological context when actually, you know, your life is, it, it can be on the line. Um, and being able to control the emotions attached to that as well. What I want to do then, all that uh, being in, in your mind and this image being in your mind as well, I want to give you a, a little um, freeze frame in a second. So I'm going to jump on to one picture very quickly. It's the start of a Grand Prix. And I want you to think about the pressures a Formula One driver is under. Think about what they have to execute. Think about the dangers. Uh, maybe even think about that, um, you know, they have a family and uh, their kids are playing up the other side of the world. And there's lots of other things that are going on inside the, the driver's head. And now I want you to try and execute and absorb as much information as possible in this next slide. So, Nora, just give them half a second. Look at the screen very closely. And I want you to see what you can absorb from this. Are you measuring my cognitive performance also with a half a second? All right, okay. let's go. Three, two, one. Very good. Okay, that was pretty quick. So what did you see? How many cars? Where is the corner? When to break? Um, you can put it in the chat if you want, or just have a think about it. Um, but this in reality is an image that they might see, you know, very, very quickly. Um, if you could jump onto the next slide, Nora. Did you see, you know, in the in the kind of pink orange uh, arrow, did you see the lockup, the, the second car uh, on the inside behind the, the first one closest to you? Did you notice where the corner was? Um, and what are you thinking? Did you make a decision? Are you going to follow which car? Are you going to follow which line? You've got some options there. Um, the corner is coming up. Are you going to go for it? Are you going to dive up the inside? Are you going to hold back? I want to put this to life. And so we've got a little video to, to show you. And you can actually see the, see the outcome of this. Um, that's not the outcome, by the way. Off the start line, and you'll see in a couple of seconds the, the freeze frame that we went through. So what are you going to do now? Now, this is an experienced driver. Um, thanks, Nora. So, you know, he actually makes a very good decision. And you'll see if you let this play out, Nora, where he holds back. Lots of cars crash on the left-hand side. Initially loses a position or two, but focuses on the exit. Um, now, I'm talking quite technically about specifically in the, in the cockpit. It's a really good exit, and again, doesn't go into this corner too deep, two cars on the outside lose positions and he gains a lot from this. And this is Felipe Massa a few years ago. You would expect this from maybe an experienced driver. They have the resources emotionally, psychologically to make good decisions. Um, and they've got some good experience, but also, you know, they're doing some good things behind the scenes as well. So, you know, you need to do that in order to progress your career or just maintain your career. So there's a hell of a lot of pressure in those first few seconds of, of driving a Formula One car. So um, if you can move on, Nora. My question as a coach is, is how did that make you feel? Were you even aware of it? Were you excited? Were you nervous, anxious? Uh, maybe, you know, it's a Tuesday afternoon and you're a bit tired and, and you know, actually weren't too engaged with it. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we see that as well with experienced drivers. They've been there all the time and um, and they need to get themselves, you know, prepared in a different way. You can move on, Nora, again. Yeah. I'll give you just a little visual here as just a comparison. So think about an important occasion. Uh, it might be an interview. It might be public speaking. It might be a Formula One race. Um, now think about your arousal and, and your performance. And we've got arousal on the bottom, performance on the left. Now, this theory states that Increased arousal um, causes increased performance up to a certain point. If your arousal continues and our stress levels continue, it can actually be um, debilitating to performance. So think about this graph and how you're able to get into that middle ground. 
Um, and there's lots of facets to this, you know, your type of personality. Sometimes people sit on the far right if they're uh, very extrovert and slightly more um, yeah, aggressive in certain sporting okay, uh, situations and people on the left are a little bit more conservative. Um, now, the preparation required for different people mm. uh, and different types of people is different depending on where we are. Um, but I'll I'll hand over to, to Chris to talk about this maybe a little bit more, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting from, from my perspective, because when you are preparing a driver for the opening stages of a, of a, of a race, and I saw someone um, identified quite correctly um, that particular clip coming from um, the, the Red Bull ring, all, all, all race starts are, are the same. There's, there's, a, there's a lot to, to lose and there's a lot to gain. But the idea of being able to make better decisions and do good problem solving under extreme pressure is a really hard thing to train without actually doing it. And that's one of the problems that we have in Formula One, because there is no real practice. There are no practice races. It's not like um, working with a football team who play on a Saturday afternoon, but also have the opportunity to play friendlies or um, train throughout the week uh, to psychologically model what the Saturday afternoon game may be like. So rather than spend all of our time and energy on the heat of the moment stuff, we sort of work our way back and say, OK, at what points can we impact a driver's mindset? What do we know about them that gets them into that sweet spot? If you think back to that curve um, and that sweet spot between being under aroused and, and over aroused, that would allow us to, of course, specific to the individual, ensure that they stay in that magic band um, in, in the middle. The first thing that springs to mind, of course, is pre-performance routines. Um, a lot of drivers will do some breath work. They will do some visualization. If we're working on a cognitive level, there may be some self-talk um, that, that's involved. There may be some final messages from an engineer or, or a performance team. And then there will be some behavioral stuff around body language and releasing tension in, in the parts of the body that they specifically feel um, tension. Now, that's work that will happen 10 minutes before uh, a, a race or half an hour before a race but of course that really in terms of preparation is the final piece in the puzzle before a driver goes and, and and delivers what we're now going to go on and talk about is what that preparation looks like before you've even arrived at a racetrack consider it to be a long process where our pre-performance routine from a mental and physical perspective is the final bit what does that part beforehand uh, look like hmm. Can you, though, um, our clients are always looking for, you know, what's one strategy that I could try in the heat of the moment? Is it is it breath work? Is it visualization? What type of, you know, small hacks would you actually suggest that people at least try? I think breath work is a, is a nice one to, to, to go to. It's something tangible. It's something that from a scientific perspective, there is decent amounts of, of, of research around. It speaks to that link from a central nervous system perspective between the mind, between the mind and, and the body. Ordinarily, and we'll talk about this later in the presentation, the heavy lifting um, work psychologically is done uh, before the event. In the heat of the moment, it's really, really difficult. And of course, the fail safe, if you feel like you're under extreme pressure and you're struggling to cope, is try and remove yourself from the environment. Not possible for a Formula One mm -hmm. driver. I, I've yet to see a, a driver hop out of their car um, on a grid and decide that they need some space before the, before the race begins. Of course, if you're delivering a big presentation or you're in an important meeting, you might be in a similar type situation. So slowing slowing your breathing cognitively going to a safe space that might give you a bit of perspective that are two things that we can reach for but honestly Nora it's really really difficult hmm. so let's then go to you know what have the drivers done in the pre-season pre-season to actually optimize for performance um but before we get there we will ask you in the audience uh what impacts your performance negatively and you should be able to add in one or two words uh, of what impacts your personal performance. Now, why we ask this is we often talk about high performance, about boosting your performance with clients, and that's often the goal. But then there's real life. There's traffic, there's kids, there's bad bosses, there's you know tight deadlines, and all these factors keep keep us from reaching that better performance. So to get at that, we need to, of course, work on the negatives. When you look at these 
uh, words. We see bad sleep, uh, self-doubt, distractions, interruption of flow. Are these some of the same types of uh, factors that you see in for athletes as well? Dan? Certainly stress, the one in the middle and, and self-doubt is, you know, a lot more common than people think. I mean, you, you know, you see a Formula One driver, you see an elite athlete and you think that there's, you know, they're infallible um, and that there's no self-doubt and, you know, they don't have as much stress as the rest of us because they're in this glamorous sport and they're, they're very talented individuals. But, um, you know, the stress management side of things is is, is very important um, as that graph, you know, that simple graph before showed you that, you know, Added stress, added arousal um, to a certain point is is debilitating to our to our performance, um, and can lead to you know poor sleep. It can lead to, to mm. tension. It can lead to, you know, uh, this kind of um, yeah feeling like everything's a threat essentially, um, which doesn't help our our thinking and our and our performance. Um, we need to stay with a kind of wider uh, perspective and and try and absorb information better rather than honing in on the on the dangers. Um, mm. but yeah certainly um a lot of these are very uh are very common in, in f1 drivers as well so self-doubt how do you work on that actually chris from a psychological perspective yeah we'll, we'll speak about this um in a bit when we when we talk about um individual differences but if you take a strength-based model um and, and take any any individual ordinarily self-doubt is is marked as a sort of negative and something that detrimentally um, impacts performance. But the, the way that we look at it, again, you leaning on that idea of a strengths-based approach is to say it's just the flip side of the coin to someone that's quite emotionally intelligent and challenges and questions whether or not they're, they're good enough. There's plenty of good that, that comes mm -hmm. from that as a, as, a, as a way of operating in relation to team relationships and working and working with, with others, continuously challenging themselves um, to, to be better. I would categorize self-doubt to be at the extreme end of, of um, that particular way of, 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 seeing, of seeing the world. And of course, it needs, needs management. But irrelevant of the individual that you're dealing with, more often than not, and, and Dan just, just referred to it there, I think people would be surprised at the amount of those words that are completely applicable when working in, in, in Formula One. Of course, there are certain drivers that, that we've worked with over the years that don't have any of that going on at, at all. But equally, they have their own challenges when when they uh, when it comes to working with them. Um, sometimes around taking accountability, or sometimes around learning from from mistakes. More often than not, the driver here is is fear of consequences, the fear of it going wrong, and um, with that um, that that sort of driver will will make friends with other um, things that will, will cause an issue. Someone put the road comparison down there. It's probably something that I've dealt with two or three times over over the course of the last weekend. A driver's obsession with checking on what their teammates doing, um, and either how far, uh, far up the road or, or behind they are um, in in relation to their in relation to their teammate. It, it, it's the very same thing that we've just been speaking about. It's it's the fear of it not going their way and what the consequences of that might be in relation to their job security or how they're being perceived by the wider world. It's paradoxical that at the top of the world, self-doubt is probably at the highest at the same time. So Dan, how would you, as a coach, work with a driver to prepare for the season, to be fit to drive, to be optimal, to be at optimal conditions uh, for the season? Yeah, there's there's obviously a lot of uh, work that happens behind the scene uh, physically on the on the fitness side. And I think the key thing here is to to think about um, is, you know, try getting on the bike or try going for a run and, and pushing yourself quite hard and then trying to do some sort of mental task. Um, you know, it becomes quite difficult just to do simple tasks of, of adding up certain sums. Um, so a, a big goal of our programs over the winter is to try and increase the capacity uh, of the driver's tolerance to to that physical load. It, it gives them more space uh, to focus on these complex, complex mental tasks. So obviously physical fitness is a, is a huge component um, and we don't get an awful lot of time throughout the season. So we need to try and get them into, you know, the best possible phys, uh, fitness shape as, as we can at the start, because we know it will probably tail away a little bit. And that's going to be a big challenge as the season, um, you know, is, is longer than ever before. Obviously, other lifestyle factors we really want to jump on and make an impact on that are going to positively affect 
um, you know, performance, recovery. So uh, any changes we can make to, to their sleep, uh, sleep hygiene and sleep health, um, anything we can look at in terms of optimizing their nutrition um, to help their immune system when they're traveling um, to different places and on long haul flights is going to have a positive impact as well uh, on their performance. So there's some quite powerful things that you can do uh, behind the scenes just to put them into, you know, a more optimal position to uh, to take on uh, a challenging season. You can almost have a cheat sheet of the, the circle here behind all of us of the different elements that, yeah. that we work through. Yeah, absolutely. And it's very individual as well. So some will need to work on areas of, of fitness and strength more than others. Uh, mm. Juniors coming up might need to do more, more network. Um, and then you'll get others that, you know, don't have a good lifestyle uh, in terms of their sleeping. And that's where they're going to make a big impact in terms of that. Di- we know that directly affects emotional regulation and certain cognitive skills. Um, so, you know, if you're one of those people who is, is only sleeping five or six hours a night, then that's where you focus on. You don't focus on the physical fitness side of things um, because we know, you know, that added sleep will make the biggest the biggest difference. I guess that's one of the the biggest questions we get with our corporate clients. It's that all of these well-being things, they seem so soft and fluffy. What has that got to do with how I actually show up at work? How I lead, how I think, how I analyze, how I relate to everyone else? Because it seems so far off from nutrition, from sleep, from recovery, and things like that. But you're saying that that's actually what you work on with these drivers. Absolutely. Some of the most, you know, the, the most important cognitive demands of a uh, of a Formula One driver are uh, confidence um, and uh, achievement motivation and, and that focus side of things, concentration. And we know confidence can be boosted with just, you know, seven minutes of exercise. It can boost our positive emotions and make us feel better. Um, and the same with exercise, you know, over a short amount of time, it can increase oxygen saturation to the brain, which can help with things like reaction times. So, you know, making sure that we do this preparation before an important task, before an important event is absolutely vital um, and doing it in a, you know, quite a specific um, way and taking care over it. The same with sleep, you know, mm. it's, it's basic, it's a basic human function, but maybe we don't give it the respect and dive into it uh, in as much depth as we should. Mm. So, yeah, fundamentals, but at, a, at the highest level we can. Yeah. So, Chris, the same question to you. What are the tools or strategies that you use with the driver from a psychological perspective to prepare for the season? Yeah, if, if you just put up the uh, the slide around those um, profile differences there, Nora, that would be a, a nice reference point for us all to, to, to look at. The biggest challenge we have with, with drivers, and they understand theoretically that um, they need to improve their sleep or look at that as a real focus point. The nutrition is obviously massively important. The gym work and their, and their strength work is something that is going to aid them. To, to latch on to a couple of points that Dan just, Dan just made there, we know that from a science of high performance perspective, recovery is, is key. So we need to be doing everything on a daily basis to ensure we're optimizing that also we know and going back to my point around not being able to practice here we need to do everything we possibly can before jumping into a race car that we know positively impacts cognitive performance and that is around sleep that is around how long they're working for that is around levels of 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 arousal the challenge that we have with um the the coaches and, and and their individual drivers is how do i ensure that my driver is committing and motivated to work at this every single day and that takes us to the next slide here. And lesson number one is let's understand the person that we're dealing with. Self-awareness is king and awareness is king for, for those that are surrounding that, that individual. These are two um, profiles of, of something uh, that, that we use uh, by way of a psychometric with, with the racing drivers. These are actually two drivers um, uh, profiles here. The tool is called Spotlight. That doesn't make a huge amount of difference. I'll talk you, I'll talk you through um, what you're seeing on, on the screen um here in a moment but the thing to to hold dear is actually if we've got our driver here on on the left that profiles in one way and our driver on the right that profiles in another we're going to deal with them quite differently so on the left as you look at the screen here my driver is coming out as forcefully optimistic this is your typical racing driver profile forceful refers to competitive and control seeking and task orientated and uh wanting to do things their own way so far, so typically racing driver. The optimistic part, unsurprisingly, 
um, leans to that idea of being sensitive to to reward and what can be gained in any given situation. So if Dan gets given a driver and he has a list of jobs that he wants to get through that driver, um, get through with that driver across the course of the week and says, right, this is what we know about our driver. How do we do this? We need to make sure that the driver has an element of control over what they're doing. They're not going to respond brilliantly well to being told what to do. Dan will agree that that sounds fairly typical in terms of in terms of working with with racing drivers. But they're optimists. They need to see the benefit in in what they're doing as well. They need to see why they're being asked to um, do that extra piece of, of gym work or why they're being asked to try and get themselves to bed an hour and a half earlier because they're sensitive to what can be gained in any given situation. And we're just we're just playing to that um, to a degree on the right hand side. Equally as successful a racing driver, but with a very different character personality if we look at how they how they profile. So still forceful to a degree, but far more logical in their approach, analytical, detail orientated, wanting to have things clear and identifiable so they can put markers in and be able to measure back against. But if you look at that um, purple bit, that, that speaks to the idea that they are not like our our first driver sensitive to reward they're sensitive to threat they're very aware of what could go wrong and therefore when we're working with that driver we're putting arguments in place and we're putting things in place to allow them to work around potential issues in the future they're looking at what may go wrong over the course of a busy race season and we're putting plans in place to try and avoid that then of course we speak to that logical bit and we say right this is what it's going to look like on a day-by-day -day basis they get a load of security and solace from that so we've got two drivers we've got a uh, a body of work that needs to get done but the way that we're dealing with them is incredibly different there are no right or wrong profiles we get what we're given and we work with what we what we have but understanding mm. where your starting point is, is really really important in a performance sense here so what i'm hearing from you is that there's an a huge level of personalization in how you then approach each driver. So it's less about one size fits all and more about what's the best for you. Um, <clears throat> and there, there's a question here in the, from the audience as well. You know, what differs between a senior or veteran like Alonso from someone who is more of a junior? Does age and experience beat the fresher? Um, and does this change? over your career or is this sort of fixed in who you are yeah so uh, it, it certainly doesn't make too much of a difference in relation to um how easy or difficult the driver is to, to to work with it's not a case of the more experienced drivers um because they've been there and they've seen it and they've done it um being easier to work with sometimes the complete opposite because they've, they've got themselves into some really bad habits but on, on the flip side, um, there is an argument to be made that a lot of the time drivers that are just coming into the sport, rookies, don't know what they don't know. So it, it's sometimes difficult, especially at this stage in the season, although we haven't got any rookies on the grid uh, this year, it's really difficult to predict how they might react under, under extreme pressure. Of course, we can, based on prior experiences and previous behaviours, we can have a, a decent enough guess, but that's the challenge. Um, that's the challenge when working with the, when working with the, the, the younger ones. I actually just saw a, a, something come up in the, the chat that is, is really interesting to, from an individual differences perspective, touch on. The person made the point that isn't the, the, the whole idea of Spotlight to be able to shift your mindset and your behavioural style um, uh, context specific. Yes, absolutely it is. So the whole reason we, we even present a driver with this is to say, right, this is our starting point. This is our default stance. Um, but we need to learn how to move into different areas that might aid us in certain situations. That being said, we do know that under, under pressure, that spotlight is likely to narrow and revert more to type. So we need to play to those strengths at the same time. Yeah, I like that. You Under pressure, you revert to type. I can also imagine that this uh, can be interesting to look at from a team perspective. If you have a team of just optimistic, forceful uh, people, you will get blind spots, right? So understanding what that team dynamics looks like, and especially under pressure, um, do you do that for the teams as well? Yeah, it's it's the same point, Nora, that we've just been discussing around this, uh, identifying the starting point and knowing um, what the group as a whole think like, although of course there's going to be a myriad of different profiles within the room. There may be a skew towards a certain direction. Uh, engineers, for example, tend to be quite logical in their approach and quite con contained. 
Um, but actually the ideal is, as we've just been discussing, a group of individuals that understand their, their starting point, but then can move, then can move and adapt um, under pressure because they realize the, the context shift. Yeah. So um, you mentioned earlier that this is a dangerous sport. So let's talk a bit about the importance of preparing for the worst. Um, we have again a poll for the audience. When things go badly, what type of strategies do you use, use yourself? And I will start the uh, the poll or the open ended question. We'll see the question or answers pop up. Um, <clears throat> how do you work with the drivers to prepare them or make sure that when things really go bad, they have a good response? Dan? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's incredibly challenging for, you know, uh, different drivers and different, depending on what the situation is. Um, I think, you know, Chris mentioned it before, the level of uh, self-awareness um, that is really important. And, and that is a is a skill that we can all adopt understanding how we react under under stress and under under pressure um if you can be aware of that then you can start to act on it um and if you're aware of um you know certain behaviors or sort of communication certain mental skills that get affected then you can start to to do something about it i'll actually i'll use myself as a bit of a, an example you know we we use something called stress tells uh, in coaching and in, and in corporate environments and talk about stress manifesting in different ways. So it could be emotional, mental, physical, or, or behavioral. Um, and I know when I get really stressed, I'll get a migraine eventually. But before that, other things happen. I might feel a bit anxious, a bit frustrated uh, because I've got too many things going on. I might feel a bit of eye pain because maybe my behavior has changed and I've started to have too much caffeine and that starts to give me a little bit of a, an ache behind my eye or, or I have a small headache from dehydration. Um, or, or short sleep so if you can start to identify those those stress tells um, you start to understand your, your body as a bit of a dashboard um, and I know we all have these wearables now which say you're under stress or under load and they can they can support that a little bit with heart rate variability and, and understanding that but understanding yourself and how you feel um, is a really good skill to have uh, from mm. a high level because you can make some actions and, and take some actions from it. You can obviously reduce the caffeine. You can try and change your sleep. You can try and, you know, um, divert some of these, uh, you know, extra tasks away from you. And sometimes the, the drivers feel overwhelmed with the amount of commitments that they have on their schedule. Um, and it's important to, to keep their mind free um, and clear for, for racing. So, um, you know, as a coach, understanding the stress tells of a driver is, is very important. Mm. I love the idea of stress tells. I actually had a client who said that her stress tell was losing things, especially her iPhone. So during a year that was very stressful for her, she lost seven iPhones. Um, so now it's become like a joke in the team of, you know, do you still have your iPhone around? Is, are mm -hmm. things good? Right. So understanding then the team also um, is important. So Chris, we're getting a lot of really good strategies um, to do uh, when things go badly. From a performance psychology perspective, what would you say are some of the go-tos? This is prevalent i suppose because of the stage in the season that we're at we've been doing this work over the last few weeks preparing drivers going into going into testing and, and the first weekend of the season i try and take as much of a sort of proactive and preventative approach to um this as i possibly can so rather than focus too much on how we're going to deal with it in the moment although there is a bit of a discussion and some strategies around that it all comes down to expectation management it it, mm. it really is that idea that and, and it's tough it's tough when you are um optimistic about how the season you hope might play out but it's about making the case that sometimes the hope is that is the most dangerous thing because we lose a grip on reality what i mean by that is well based on our experiences of however many years we've competed in this 
how regularly have things gone our way in the first race of the season or in the opening stage of, of the season. So again, if you look at some of the, the resilience work that we tend to lean on in this idea that ultimately what we want these guys to have is, is a real challenge mindset, which is to be able to predict the head, look at all the challenges that may uh, be around the corner and have contingency plans and how they're going to deal with them. It's the expectations at the start of that journey that are the most important thing. If we are planning for a plane sailing, uh, Bahrain, Jeddah, um, Melbourne, um, we're going to end up getting unstuck at some stage or another because it's not going to be plane sailing. His history tells us that. So we really need to to to, to work in, and we 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 find a bit of a balance. We don't want it to be overly negative, but we need a priming impact of. Um, putting in a, a realistic mindset as to how this might play out, including what could potentially go wrong, so that we've had a conversation around the strategies that we'd employ if that's the case. And therefore, if we do fall into um, a bit of a hole and doesn't it doesn't go particularly well, we've worked on the basis that this might happen rather than it be a complete shock and we have a sort of panic or fear response off the back of that. Mm. I liked how many of the audience's responses were actually taking a step back and doing something else, getting a good night's sleep, going for a run, going for a walk, you know, removing yourself from the situation. Uh, and often that that really gives you the perspective that you need. Nora, that's a yes. really important point, sorry, because they, they, they talk about psychological detachment being, you know, an incredibly effective, uh, you know, tool for stress management. So finding whatever it is, if it's, you know, going cycling or going and playing golf or reading a book or, you know, gazing at the stars, you know, actually value that, you know, during stressful, stressful moments. Sorry, mm -hmm. Chris, jumped in. No, I was I was just going to say, actually, in, in a really sort of very specific um, context, the idea of, of what our stress behaviours look like or how we manage stress in the heat at the moment is something that we've had a conversation with many drivers about over the course of, of the last week. And really what we're trying to do is normalise that sort of spike of emotion that they will feel if things don't go brilliantly well, but try and minimise the amount of time that that lingers around for. And again, I suppose mm -hmm. it speaks to the individual differences that you might find driver to driver and is going to be driven by the environment as well. You know, the, the opinions of the behaviours of those that that they they value the most around the team but what does it look like for you specifically if we've only got half an hour and you're in a really bad way emotionally what are the behaviors that, that we know historically have settled you what do you do who do you speak to where do you go behaviorally what does that look like so that's something we're, we're focusing our attention on mm. so on our last theme um we wanted to talk about recovery um and instead of just talking about it, I will bring up one of the audience's questions here, because it directly asks, considering the intercontinental travel between races and the race schedule, to what extent is intentional circadian phase shifting implemented prior to travel? And what does a jet lag plan or calculator look like? It's Andrew who's, who's asking this question. Yeah, happy to answer that. And actually, there's a there's a very good app called Time Shifter um, uh, that is designed uh, and and worked on by Dr. Stephen Lockley, who's a sleep expert out of Harvard University. And he uh, he actually does a lot of our um, you know bespoke plans for for the drivers. Um, so yes, we absolutely do do um, the circadian rhythm um, adjustments, um, especially you know leading to leading up to the Melbourne uh, Grand Prix. And it's vitally important trying to shift 11, 12 hours in, in one hit uh, is incredibly demanding on the body. If you can phase that over several days and you're doing a couple of hours each day, uh, it becomes you know, less demanding, um, less demanding on the immune system um, as well. And our sleep's um, going to be better, better quality. So have a look at that app, Time Shifter. Uh, if you are traveling a lot um, for, for yeah, to different time zones, uh, it can be it can be a useful, useful tool. There's a diff there's another question also around time zones. What are some of the specific hacks that you have the the drivers actually do before they travel? Yeah, adjusting your sleep is one of the biggest things that you can do. Um, so depending on which way around the world you're going, uh, bringing that earlier or, or later. Um, when you um, when you exercise, when you see uh, bright light uh, as well. So you might see some some Formula One drivers. Most uh, drivers going through the airport with, with dark glasses on, not just because they want to look cool, although it, it does help, um, but actually so they can block out some of the, the, the blue light and the bright light when they shouldn't be seeing you know, that light um, because the time zone they're going to is actually in the, in the middle of the night. Um, 
you know caffeine can help um uh, in terms of you know when you should be awake it can it can help with the alertness and and avoid um, fatigue um and yeah when you're uh, having your meal times and and implementing that um one of the best things I like to do just on the way to the airport is change my watch as early as possible to the time that you're you're on or you're expected to be on. And then every time you're looking at that, try not to miss your flight, but you will actually start to, uh, you know, start to get into that mindset of, OK, well, it's two in the morning now. I need to go and find a quiet spot to start to you know calm the body down and wind down and maybe get a little bit of a little bit of sleep. Um, but the time shifter app will actually uh, guide you on that as well. Hmm. So, Chris, what are some mental recovery or de-stressing or you call it psychological decompression techniques that you use? Yeah, the starting point is with the driver specifically is to have the conversation around um, the fact that we are designed to expend and, and renew energy. And I think from a physical perspective, they can really get their head around. Sometimes it's a bit of a sell that the emotional or mental side of things works in exactly the same way. They're pretty good at expending. They do a great job of that across the course of a race weekend. And then sometimes their ability to be able to renew leaves a bit to be desired. So we work with coaches a lot of the time around this idea of um, psychologically how to decompress. If, if you consider that across the course of a race weekend, especially on a Saturday uh, last week, but Sunday ordinarily on a, on a race day, it's a chemical party. So um, from, a, from a psychological perspective, there's going to be a crash around the corner. We sometimes call it the Monday blues, that, that feeling that they've, um, they've had this huge high um, and they haven't been able to sleep and then there's, they're feeling really low <clears> the next day. But the model that I, I tend to, to lean on and, and, and work with drivers around actually comes from Olympic sport and the decompression um, model that's been used, um, I think, developed by the EIS around there. But of course, the difference is rather than uh, a big decompression program um, that is at the end of a four year cycle, we're doing loads of little mini ones, sometimes with a really short turnaround time. Take this weekend um, going into next weekend as an example. Uh, a lot of drivers will have um, competed in, in Bahrain and either flown home or stayed somewhere in, in the Middle East before heading to, to Saudi um, for, the, for the next race. In really simple terms, there's, there's four areas that we encourage coaches to work with with their drivers. Number one, the importance of the hot debrief. So in the heat of the moment, when they just finish the event, just letting them speak about how it's gone without any interruption or without trying to apply any logic to, to what they're saying. Just I, I always refer to it with, with coaches as releasing the pressure valve and just letting all of it, all of it out. The next stage is around what we would call sort of time zero. So uh, this is often the days um, after the, the big event, just removing them from the environment as much as we possibly can. Most drivers I work with will try and get out of the hotel that they were based in on the Sunday night if they possibly can, even if it's just to go and stay in another hotel, change the environment, give them an opportunity to, to reset during this time. And sometimes it's, you know, you're allowed two or three days to, to, to go through this period. Sometimes it's, it's half a day to a day because there's a tight turnaround as there is. Um, this week, it's a case of trying to uh, detach from from racing as much as possible. Connect with loved ones around them, spend time on other people that aren't aren't themselves. Distract as much as we possibly can. Once we feel like time zero has reached its natural course, or in the case of this week, we need to start moving things along because we have another race around the corner. Then we go into the processing emotion stage. That's when we start to sometimes challenge that emotional thinking that you heard in the hot debrief. Look for. Um, positives if it feels like it's particularly negative look for things that they can take accountability for if that hasn't been identified um previously but but really just teasing out what happened and then the fourth part is is handing that driver back over to the team and saying right i think we're in a position now to do a proper performance debrief based on some good thinking and some checking and some challenging so that they're best prepared for um for the next race i love that framework and, and i can imagine that skipping over step one and two the, the hot debrief, the pressure valve, and then removing yourself from the situation and directly trying to go to a debrief might actually be a recipe for lots of emotions uh, and not very uh, objective analysis. Well, there's, so, there's plenty of times yeah. over, over the course of just standing in a paddock, you'll see um, people with good intentions and the best will in the world talking to a helmet that the, the driver hasn't even taken the helmet off and they're trying to reassure them that perhaps it's not as bad as they thought uh, I can almost assure them at that stage that the, the driver is not processing any any of that they they may as well be talking to a helmet that doesn't have a head in it because they're going to get as much sense out, <laughs> as much sense out of that so yeah we, we try and employ the system as best we can just to just to move that um, processing and the emotion um, along as quickly as you can 
Luckily, in the business world, we never do that. We always yeah. give time and space <laughs> to, to people. <laughs> um, so back to audience questions. We have uh, a bunch about data and assessments. Um, and we have Shishang who's asking, Dan, how does the testing and assessment of the driver take place? Um, and related to that, Oscar is asking, what are the metrics, the data flow that you keep track of in terms of sleep, nutrition, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, big question. I'll answer the second one first. So the, the yeah, we look at nutritional bloods. We look at the, a lot of levels uh, within the bloods in terms of the, the micronutrients and uh, maybe do a couple of tests, maybe three tests uh, a year maximum. Um, the sleep metrics, you know, depending on what they're using, uh, we'll look at nocturnal heart rates and heart rate variability, and um, you can get a good score with, you know, um, the aura rings and the whoop bands and, and things like that. Um, and then in terms of uh, testing, um, you know, obvious one that we do is is neck testing. Um, and we carry that out, especially with, with junior drivers, but also if there's been any sort of um, you know gap in in racing, um, or we think it's a, an area of of, of weakness, um, and then general um, fitness testing. So making sure um, you know VO two max is at a, a decent level, and we're aiming for you know sixty and above really um, for for drivers, um, and strength testing in in, in various uh, specific places as well, especially around the trunk, um, the leg uh, for braking as well. Um, and uh, postural uh, tests as well, because it's not a particularly comfortable place uh, to be in uh, within the car. Um, so, yeah, we do try and uh, you know have a look, have a good look at uh, various components um, before the season starts. So there's a question around um, coaching as well from Luca. Uh, what are when you meet a driver for the first time? How do you approach them, and how do you create a good relationship? What does that coaching relationship really look like, or specialist relationship? You can both uh, answer this. Go for it, Chris. You go first. Yeah, I, I um, my my relationship with with the drivers or, or the athletes is perhaps slightly different to the, the Dan's. He would be well placed to talk to um, how to begin that that process my advice to coaches like dan is, is always just um get to know the, the person first before we delve into the high performance athlete related things these guys have a fascinating relationship in, in as much as they often see uh the person they're working with far more they than they do their their friends or their partners or, or their kids it, it's also a case the reality is hey they have breakfast lunch and dinner with each other for, for weeks on end so there needs to be that sort of rapport in place common interest thing that they can talk about away from um away from a high performance world but but the the thing that i think from a performance perspective i always try and move towards as quickly as i possibly can is the idea of trust these these guys are high performing athletes but they live in in a world that lacks uh the, the ability to be sort of vulnerable a lot of the time the the, the bravado or the, the facade needs to be in place and they need to be uh transmitting a really positive image but of course you know F1 drivers in exactly the same way as everybody on this call will have internal challenges and, and things going on uh, behind closed doors. And I think the sooner a coach can connect with with an athlete um, on that front and demonstrate a bit of vulnerability and 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 feel the same in return and just go below the surface level um, of of the performance work, I guess. Uh, I think that's always I think that's always a great start. Hmm. Yeah. Dan, how do you build trust? Yeah, Chris has hit the nail on the head. That's really important. And actually, you know, I see the relationship, yes, it maybe starts as a professional one, but uh, certainly, you know, a friendship is is really helpful and most of them turn into that that sort of relationship. So, you know, having things that you can enjoy together, having, uh, you know, the same similar sort of sense of humour um, is, is really important. And someone that, you know, they know that, yeah, they can trust that you've got their back. Um, and, you know, it doesn't really... There's that age old saying that, you know, they don't know, they don't care how much you you know until um, they know how much you care. And, I, and it, it does ring true a lot. And I think, you know, if you're going to try and make an impact with someone and make some changes, especially if these people are quite, you know, strong personalities, which a lot of them are fitting into that forceful category, they, you know, you need to show them that you care first of all and then you can start to have an impact. And, you know, within the world of performance coaching, 
it, it's usually that people say, OK, the first year is just getting to know each other. Second year, you will enjoy it more. You will make an impact more. The third year is, you know, even more uh, impactful uh, from a professional point of view. But it takes that time to build a, a good relationship. Um, and I think the relationship is, first and foremost, the most important thing. Um, and there are not too many metrics for that, um, apart from what the other person says. Um, so I think that's, you know, it's incredibly important. Hmm. So we have a question around kids in motorsport. Uh, what would be your advice in terms of the single most important thing a young driver, for example, in karting, should learn from a mental perspective while they're still young? You want me, Dan? I was just trying to say, don't don't say choose another sport. Don't say choose another sport. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you know, I've worked with youngsters coming through in, in karting and, and into single seaters and, and it's challenging. It's a challenging sport. You know, um, I think that the, the further you go up, there's probably less in, in your control. The technology gets, um, you know, more complex. So I think you need, you should understand that, that big picture, but don't get ahead of yourself in like in any sport, you know, um, it can be great fun. And if you have a passion for it, then, um, you know, make it fun, find ways of making mm. it, uh, challenging, interesting. You hear stories of, you know, Max Verstappen going out when it was, you know, really, really wet, um, and practicing different maneuvers. And, you know, if you've got a group of friends you can go with to do it, then brilliant. Um, you know, I think that's first and foremost is, you know, to make sure it's fun because, some of that can be lost as it becomes more professional. Um, and I think that's the same in a lot of sport because it becomes big, big business. So, um, you know, in, enjoy it first and foremost. And I think you'll get the best out of the individual as well. Mm, keep the fun, the love to the game, Definitely. love to sports. Yeah. Chris, any advice? Yeah. I, you know, I'm I'm uh, not going to, to Jeddah this weekend. Instead, I'm going to Valencia for a karting race. It's a world that I've found myself in. Um, and I'm learning very quickly about it, having spent so many years in, in F1. I've, I've finally succumbed and, and uh, doing some work with some some carters and, and their and their families. The environment is is so important, you know, f from my mm. perspective. Uh, at a certain age, the work with the, the driver <laughs> or the young athlete isn't the thing. It's it's the people that um, impact how they think and they feel. That the, the the ones that I'm interested in, uh, the team parents more more often than not. I love Dan's point around it being fun. I saw a wonderful clip with Podrick Harrington. The, the, the golfer who said you you want to take a, a young golfer off a golf course when they're enjoying it the most because then they want to go back the moment they're not enjoying it anymore um and they get taken off they're quite they're quite relieved so that was something that really really stuck with me but then i, I had a conversation yesterday with the with the, the client and, and their coach that i'm going to be spending the weekend with and he was getting so fixated on uh results and outcomes and the number next to his name and i said to him look if this all goes well and you find yourself in F1 in however many years' time, are you going to remember where you placed at the random karting event that you completed in six or seven years earlier? This came off the back of a direct challenge to him where I said, what, why are we doing this at the moment? Why do we do what we do? And he said, to, to win. Of course, it's not to win, it's to learn. It's to learn and it's to develop and it's to grow because if his career goes the way he wants it to, he won't remember what the results are when he finally gets to where he wants to get to, he'll get there because of the learning and the developing and the growing he's done at this stage. So that would be my second second advice. Just park the results completely um, and, and look at ways in which they can demonstrate how they're how they're progressing. The, the, the final thing I'll leave you with is we always use the phrase with these guys, are we leaving the racetrack a better driver than when we drove in this morning? And if we are, then it's been a great day. Hmm. I like that advice actually as uh, to end this session. I think it's advice all of us can take, not just kids in the karting. We've listen, guys, it's been a great discussion. We had so many more questions uh, from the audience, uh, but we can't get to them today. Maybe we'll do a follow-up at some point. Now, to the audience, if we at Hinsa can help you as an athlete, individual, leader, or organization with better life and better performance, reach out, be in touch. We're happy to help. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. I wish you all the best of luck, skill, and well-being in the race of your life.